perhaps in a certain sense, this being the third and final segment, you've been hearing three different ways of espousing basically the same thing. I think it's more to our benefit that we exchange viewpoints in by way of dialogue rather than hearing certain things which are oft repeated. We can promise to generate jobs for everybody, but we know the truth behind it. What politicians can do and should do is to stick to our core competence, which is to manage the public infrastructure, to provide a stable platform of investments and opportunities for private initiative to come in. Our greatest economic challenge is to grow by at least 8% per annum on a sustained basis. To raise our cap per capita income from the current $1,900 in 2009 to $3,200 by the end, hopefully, of my term, and to double it by the year 2018. That's a tall order, but it must be a goal that all of us set our minds to in order for us to grow out of the hole that we are in and to sustain that growth in the face of competition by our neighbors and sometimes among ourselves. The most important thing that a president must do must to be create institutions of public governance in the country. Number one, for the national government, and number two, to provide an example, albeit local governments have autonomy, to local governments by way of initiatives for those who show good management practices and investor-friendly practices and cracking the whip on those who do not. We have to reform this bureaucracy though because of the fact that it is a major influence in our economic growth. Permits are granted, decisions and policies are made with effects on all levels of society, particularly the local government, which oftentimes is the first point of contact between any individual requiring something in a locality and the national government. It's the local government that starts first and we need to have that two-step process of reform in our bureaucracy. We have to change our paradigms of governance in, public, in the public sector to add more incentives for good behavior at the same time, cracking down hard on that behavior. There is such a thing as the Caribbean stick policy. Unfortunately, our policy in government is all stick. And so I propose, because of the fact realistically that in the first year we will lack resources to do so, to use your 100 days. 100 days of goodwill to invite as transparently as possible in the same way as I manage the Department of National Defense to attract DOTs and DBPs. Of course, we must spur private initiative in rural areas too. However, on the long run, what national government should do really is to stick to major infrastructure and major physical improvements of our country, to spur synergies and development between the countryside and the cities. I will institutionalize the independence of the Banco Central ng Pilipinas for exchange rate stability, price stability, and if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I agree in principle that we may have to increase consumption taxes for the simple reason that our income taxes and corporate taxes are the highest in this area and it is getting to the point of being uncompetitive. And unfortunately, income taxes and corporate taxes capture only a certain segment who are already captured and any increase will only prejudice the capture. What I propose, if the need be that we only increase perhaps the base of EVA, secondly, if it is unavoidable, the rate of EVA and other excise and specific taxes, particularly on sin products. Tax policy and tax administration must go hand in hand. Tax administration must be simplified too. Until such time as a businessman 
can very well understand how to fill out his own tax return, then tax administration is still too hard, still too difficult. We have to reduce the transaction costs of filing returns and paying our taxes through simplified tax procedures. Most local governments that have proven perhaps the capability to run their hospitals properly can continue to be participants in the healthcare system. Private micro insurers, big insurers, we all got to dialogue and have and evolve a workable universal participative plan where everybody should be covered to spread the risk, so they say, for in one form or another, rich and poor. Preventive health care is more important probably than curative, uh, the curative side of health care. You have your barangay health care workers. It's a very rich source of manpower that you can tap, properly regulated, properly supervised in order to spread preventive healthcare practices in the barangays. They're already there. It's a question of integrating them into the national healthcare system. English proficiency should be introduced to children's education at the soonest possible time, in the best way available. Basic education reform is necessary because if we do not strike at the root of the problem of our human capital, then tertiary education cannot be remedied. If a person doesn't want to complete the 12-year education that international standards have, or probably we may have to introduce, then that person can only go to a vocational college and not go to a university anymore. Perhaps that's one way of approaching the problem. However, basic education reform is a must. We must avoid those kinds of compromises and try to implement the program strictly. For tertiary education, I propose a student loan program. Why? Because we cannot afford private educational institutions and public educational institutions subsidizing costs of education. Education is inherently expensive. And by way perhaps of a workable student loan program managed by a public trust institution of proven competence and together with giving a way to track the progress of the student, meaning to say, for example, giving him an SSS number or her an SSS number as she takes out the loan and hopefully it's captured in the system when she, she earns money or he earns money, you can now deduct so that the, the, the program uh, is a going concern, theoretically. I have proposed before that the SSS manage it, but not using SSS funds. There must be a capital infusion in a separate trust account by the national government for that, so workers' money is not unduly used. There must be a convergence between the agrarian reform program and agricultural entrepreneurship. Stakeholders should agree. What is the end? And the end is food security for everybody. And naturally, that goes to with the amelioration of the conditions of subsistence farmers. The best laid down plans perhaps may not be implemented if one is not a good politician. The end of the game, a president is a politician. And politics, to me, is the art of good governance. And that will involve, number one, some form of political harmony in the country, where the president must be able to engage in a principled political dialogue with political players in the country. Whereby, once and for all, we must state that there is room for politics, as we know it. There is room for a fiscalizing opposition. There is room for government advocacy or administration advocacy. But there are some items that must be left untouched. The integrity of our institutions long-term policies and plans, long-term physical infrastructure, the education of our children and health care, and the welfare of our farmers. These must be put aside. We need to have certain areas where we can work together.